Uh, this evening, as I've already mentioned uh, from uh, the prayer, we're going to be following up on one aspect of what we were looking at this morning, uh, something that really grows out of that feast of booths or tabernacles. Um, it reminds us of something that has to do with, with us as we travel through the wilderness of this world and we're on our way to our permanent home. So let's begin that um, uh, just thinking about that through the reading of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 16. We're going to be focusing primarily this evening on verses 13 through 16. But again, reminds us of the importance of faith and believing what God says and trusting His Son and trusting Him at every point in life to do things as He calls us to do them. Uh, the author to the Hebrews writes this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God." And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God." By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises but having seen them, and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, again, I would remind you this morning we saw that the gospel divides. It divides us from the world. The world isn't going to love us. The world's going to hate us. It divides us from our households. Whenever the two kingdoms exist, or I should say, wherever they exist, there's going to be division, which means there's going to be strife, there's going to be conflict, whether it's going to be with those in the world who are outside of our household or those who are in the world uh, in our household. Now, applied to the world in general, this means, of course, that the world can be a very unpleasant place uh, to be. As the agenda of the world advances, uh, it brings the world, or I should say the church, into greater and greater conflict with the world. I think the example of Saeed Abedini certainly reminds us of that. I mean, he's in a Muslim country. They hate Christians. They've imprisoned him. They've tortured him and so forth. There is conflict between the two kingdoms that exist there. 
and considering, of course, what's going on in our country. I think, uh, especially as you read uh, conservative newsletters that bring these things to our attention, uh, Christians are being more and more persecuted uh, for their faith. I mean, consider those that own Christian businesses and how they're being constantly sued uh, because they're declining to support homosexual marriage, whether it be as bakers not wanting to bake cakes or photographers not wanting to take pictures of things they cannot agree with. And when I say homosexual marriage, as you understand, I mean marriages in, in uh, quotation marks because it's not a genuine marriage. Uh, obviously, long before that happened, uh, there were other types of persecutions going on in, in, the, uh, in the world. As a matter of fact, the uh, particular movie that we're wanting to gain the uh, permission to show, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, reminds us that universities have long been persecuting scientists who believe in any form of intelligent design. And if you haven't seen the movie, hopefully the Lord will give us the chance to, uh, to view it because it brings us out very clearly. Uh, one thing uh, you've heard me mention uh, recently is that our government is soon going to begin requiring that uh, women, uh, our wives, our daughters, register for selective services. And if the draft is reinstituted, they may likely uh, be drafted to serve as military combatants, something which I think clearly the Bible is opposed to. Now again, these things are happening more and more, and as they do, it's bringing us into greater and greater conflict in the world. But as these things advance, there are two things, two promises that we should bear in mind. Uh, two things that I think can be very encouraging to us. The one is that the Lord has promised one day that he's going to change all these things. He's going to bring his kingdom with greater power and glory into this world. God has promised it. We know it's going to happen. He is ultimately going to put an end to these things. Now, secondly, if we don't happen to live to, to see that fulfilled in this world, in other words, if we live past, as it were, this coming of God's kingdom and glory, uh, we still have the promise that we will see an end to it, at least for ourselves personally, and that is when we die and we go to heaven. We have a promise from God that we are going to inherit heaven, that we are going to be a part of the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, in other words, we realize from what God tells us here, this is not our permanent home. The strife, the division that we experience now, the conflict is not going to go on forever. We are just pilgrims passing through, and it is going to come to an end. Now, our passage reminds us of this very thing in a different context, but it's something the author to the Hebrews was using to encourage his readers who were going through the difficulties they were going through in those days. He's basically cataloging those who lived the life of faith, those who took God at his word, those who lived according to that word, those who also were outcasts and hated by the world, who were suffering because of the world, to encourage them. Because these who did suffer were able to see God's promises. They could see them even though they weren't there, even though they didn't see, as it were, the fulfillment of it. And that's something, again, that's emphasized over and over again. The fact that they could see the fulfillment of them by faith encouraged them in their suffering. They realized that all those things really didn't matter. They knew that life here was brief, that it's basically like a vapor, as James says, that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. They were looking beyond this life. They were looking to that which was coming. And so they took their eyes, as it were, off this world and placed it on that heavenly country that God had provided for them. And this gave them the hope and the courage that they needed to live godly in an ungodly world. Now this evening I want us to consider that if you would have the same kind of hope, then you have to be able to do the things the author to the Hebrews was encouraging his readers to do. You must be able to see the promise by faith you have to desire what it is that God has promised. And you do need to seek after what is promised. Now, first of all, you do need to be able to see these promises by faith. And again, I would just remind you of the context. Uh, 
in which the author to the Hebrews was writing. He was writing to encourage his readers to endure the difficulties that they had to face in their particular situation. Uh, they were being persecuted by the Roman government. And the reason why the government was persecuting them is because they were part of an illegal religion. Basically, I think I've told you before that originally when Christianity was established, uh, after, you know, when Jesus did his ministry, people were following him, the Roman government looked at that as a sect of Judaism. Uh, they believed that, that it fell under the rubric of Judaism, which was a legal religion. But as they saw the Jews persecuting the Christians, they realized that this was a new religion. And it was not covered by you know, that dispensation, as it were, that they gave to the Jewish religion. One, by the way, which was won at the cost of a great deal of Jewish blood. The Jews would, just not, they would not submit to emperor worship. And so rather than letting each one of them fight to the death with them over that issue, they allowed the Jews to practice their religion. But again, seeing the Christians were not a part of that, they began to persecute the Christians. And as they did, the Christians were being tempted to go back to the old covenant system. Uh, they were being tempted to deny the Lord Jesus Christ, to reject everything the old covenant was pointing to, to turn away from uh, that new covenant which was superior in every way to the old covenant and to fall away from the only way that God has actually given that one might be saved. Now the way that he was encouraging them to stand firm, and here's, here's another one of the issues. The worship of the new covenant is spiritual in nature. I mean, just look around you. We, we don't have all those trappings of the old covenants. You know, we don't have the temple. We don't have... Uh, all the ornamentation of the temple. We don't have all the sacrifices and all the priesthood and all these concrete things. What we have is spiritual worship. Those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, it requires a greater deal, a greater measure of faith to be able to, to see the Lord Jesus Christ who is not physically present with us in heaven and to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And that was creating, again, a bit of temptation for them to go back to something concrete rather than to deal with something spiritual. Well, the author to the Hebrews is telling us that it's always, we've always needed faith, even in the old covenant, even when you had those concrete buildings and images and sacrifices and so forth. You still needed faith. The people of God have always lived by faith and particularly now you need faith to be able to see that which was unseen. Because faith is what enabled the people of God through, through every era to be able to deal with the difficulties that every Christian has had to face as they have traveled from earth to heaven and to give them the strength they needed to persevere. They need faith. So the author to the Hebrews writes this in verse 13, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. In other words, without seeing what it is that God had promised but having seen them by faith and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. The author to the Hebrews is saying to his readers, faith is what gave them that strength to endure. Faith in God's promises. Believing what God says is true. Trusting that the Lord was actually going to provide this that he has promised. That better life in a better country. They believed God, they trusted him, and so having the hope that that gave them, they pressed forward, which is, of course, what the readers, that the author is addressing this to, needed. Now, I want you to notice, too, that they believed God even though they never saw the fulfillment of his promise. Even though they lived and died and never saw these things fulfilled, he says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. Now, many of us are going to do precisely the same thing. There's many things in, in Scripture that are promised that we won't see actually until we die, and many things we won't live to see. Uh, it's possible that we will die, very likely, at least from my position, uh, 
that we will die before God's promise is fulfilled of a greater expansion and influence of his kingdom in this world. That's what God has promised, that stone cut without hands that, that destroys the feet of that statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, becomes a great mountain that fills the entire earth. We may not live to see the fulfillment of that particular promise. Um, we may not live to see it, but again, we know it's going to happen. If God has promised it, we know it's going to take place. I, I think there's a great historic example of this, and as a matter of fact, it kind of prepares us for the Reformation series that's coming up in October. Uh, Jonathan Edwards and those who lived during the Great Awakening who saw what the Lord was actually able to do uh, when he decides he's going to do it in the pouring out of his spirit. And who actually at that time also believed that God had promised to do even more than, than what they had already seen. And you know, Edwards and, and these individuals who were praying and seeking God for these greater things actually saw at least two great revivals. Well, they prayed. And they prayed that God would send even more of these revivals. They prayed believing that God was going to answer these prayers, but they did not see any further answers to these prayers. Now, does that mean that, you know, basically God didn't fulfill his word? Does that mean that they, they died uh, as fools believing that God was going to do this? No. They died in faith even though they didn't receive what God has promised, it really didn't matter because they knew that God was going to answer those prayers because they were praying according to his will. They saw through the eyes of faith. Now basically they didn't see what, how God answered those prayers, but God did answer them in, well, in the next century, basically, in the great missionary movement when the Lord, as it were, stirred up the hearts of his people to begin to think about all those lost souls and all those differing nations on earth that would die and, and be punished for their sins eternally if they did not receive the gospel. So basically, they believed and they looked to God and they sought God and they died in faith without receiving the promises, at least those particular promises, but they still believed that God was able to do it. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to believe that what God says is true, even if we never live to see it fulfilled. Now, I told you this morning that we were you know, going to come back to this example of the uh, Feast of Booze, because I think it's a wonderful example of how the Lord calls us to live during this time in faith of something greater. This morning we saw Jesus' brothers encouraging him to go up to Judea to this feast of booze, this feast of tabernacles. We didn't really have time to look at that feast, but I think it's a great illustration of what we're talking about here. So I thought it would be helpful to read about its institution in Leviticus 23, verses 34 through 44. The Lord said through Moses, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the 15th of this seventh, seventh month is, a, is the feast of booze, for seven days to the Lord. On the first day is a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work of any kind. For seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord. It is an assembly. You shall not do any laborious work. These are the appointed times of the Lord which you shall proclaim as holy convocations to present offerings by fire to the Lord, burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings. Each day's matter on its own day, besides those of the Sabbaths of the, of the Lord and besides your gifts and besides all your votive and free will offerings which you give to the Lord. On exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, when you, are, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days, with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Now on the first day you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall thus celebrate it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. 
You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in booths for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the sons of Israel the appointed times of the Lord. Now, as I said this morning, this was one of the three feasts that God required all the Jewish males to attend. And it was meant to be a reminder to them of the wilderness wanderings uh, when they had to live in tents after they came out of Egypt before the Lord brought them into a uh, permanent city until he gave them the land where they could build houses because they didn't have to move anymore. The Lord wanted them to remember and to be thankful for the many mercies that he had already shown them. By the way, God has given us a memorial today to remind us of his kindness and his mercy in the Lord's table. It causes us to look back and to see what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, what God the Father has done for us through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. The Feast of Booze was meant to get them to look back at his mercies in taking care of them for those 40 years in the wilderness and the reminder that he brought them into the land that he had promised to give them. But now getting to our point, the Feast of Booze was also a figure or type of the wanderings of spiritual Israel in the world. And by spiritual Israel, I mean the church. Because the church is essentially the true Israel of God. I know that goes against the grain of what many churches believe today. But essentially, those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are children of promise, even as Isaac, and they are the true seed of Abraham. They are the true Israel of God. And like Israel, we also are basically wandering in the world. So in other words, this feast was instituted not just to remind them of what God did for them in the wilderness, it was also instituted to teach us something. That right now, we are living in a wilderness that this isn't our permanent home, that we are just passing through. And like Israel, uh, the, the Israel according to the flesh, you might say, we also are living in tents. We're also experiencing affliction. But one day the Lord tells us we won't need to live in these tents any longer or to experience the affliction from the division between these two kingdoms because these tents will be torn down and we will then move to our permanent residence in heaven. Now, let me just read to you what Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4 through uh, verse 16 through chapter 5 verse 10. And again, I think this is an encouragement to us, especially for those of us who have reached the end of our pilgrimage, or perhaps for those of us who know those who are near and dear to us who have. If they've trusted in Jesus, there is something more glorious ahead. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Therefore we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, they're temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I want you to notice that again, Paul is saying we don't walk by sight. The things that we see are only temporary. The things we don't see are eternal. We need to walk by faith and not by sight and to know that when these tents are torn down, when we die, we will be with the Lord. Now, believing this promise, knowing that God is faithful, knowing that he is true, is going to go a long ways in giving you the strength and the courage you need to be able to walk in this world and to be willing to suffer the persecution and the affliction for going against the grain, for going upstream against the world. But in order to do this, you do have to see the promise. And as we're reminded by the author to the Hebrews, you can only see it by faith. But there's something else that you need besides believing these things are true. You also have to desire what it is that God has promised. Again, the author to the Hebrews writes this in verse 13. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. You see, they not only saw them or believed that these things were true, but they saw it as something that was desirable, something they wanted, something that they welcomed. Now, the author to the Hebrews is telling us about the character of saving faith. He's, he's not talking about just faith in general. And I think we can understand what he is saying more clearly when we review what it is that faith is you know, really made up of. It really does have three parts. There has to be content to this faith, the things that we are to believe. There has to be, in a sense, or the belief that the things that we read about in the Scriptures are actually true. And there has to be trust. We have to actually apply this truth to our lives. It's possible to have a sense, to believe the, the, the truth of the things the Bible says without trust. Now, you can believe, in other words, what God says is true without actually being saved by these things. And the classic illustration of this is the demons. What I'd like to do is read for you James chapter 2, verses 18 through 20 to contrast these two types of faith because, again, it's, it's, we need more than just belief that these things are true. We need to welcome them and we need to apply them. James writes, beginning in verse 18, But someone may well say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? James here is asking the question, what is the difference between demonic faith and saving faith? He says both believe the truth. Both may even have you know, correct belief. They may believe the right things. The difference is only one of them actually applies that truth to life. Saving faith uh, bears the fruit of good works because they, well, not just believe the truth, but they love that truth. You see, it moves from the mind to the body or basically to the actions. It goes beyond thoughts. It reaches our affections, our hearts, and it influences the way we live. The demons believe, they shudder, but they don't obey. They don't submit to what God says. They don't live according to that, you know, that law that he has given to us. But the one who has saving faith does. So basically, it's not enough to know what God promises. It's not enough even to believe that what he says is true. You also need to desire it to the point where you will do what we see next. And basically the final point is you need to seek after what God has promised. You need to believe it's true, you need to desire it, and you need to seek it. And that's what we see in verses 13 through 16. 
Now again, the author writes, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So what will be true of you if you have saving faith, if you have the kind of faith that the author of the Hebrews is actually describing here, uh, the kind that will give you that motivation, that encouragement that you need in order to walk through this world and endure whatever you have to endure to make it to heaven? Well, knowing what God promises and believing it to be true, you will apply that truth. You will live it. You'll experience it in your own life. Uh, you'll seek to do what it is that God calls you to do. Now, the first thing he says you will do is that you will confess or you will accept the fact that you are strangers and exiles on this earth. In other words, you're not citizens of this world. You're from another country. You don't belong here. This isn't your home. You've taken up the Lord's commission. You've picked up your cross. You've died to yourself. You've died to this world. You've put your hand to the plow, and you have no intention of turning back or of going back to the world. You're not thinking anymore of the country you came out of. God's called you out of that country. Now you're thinking only about that which is ahead of you. You will seek what God has promised, that better country, the country you now belong to, the country you are now a citizen of, that heavenly country, the things that are above and not the things that are below. Now again, speaking more plainly, basically you're, you will no longer live for this world. You'll no longer live for self, for self-glory. You'll no longer live for your own pleasure in this world, but you will find your pleasure in seeking God's glory. You will live as we saw our Lord Jesus Christ live this morning, as a servant of God, you'll follow that example and you will use your time to serve, keeping your eyes at all times fixed upon heaven, again, encouraging yourself in the fact that one day you will actually be there. Now, we read in this text that if you are willing to do this, if you are willing to believe God's promise, if you're willing to welcome it and you're willing to actually apply it to your life, the Lord says that he will not be ashamed to be called your God. Now that does imply that he is ashamed when those who profess to know him uh, but really are of the world, that he is ashamed when they call him their God. He's ashamed because of the way they represent him. They say that they know him, but they live in as though basically they deny him. By their, by their lives, they deny what they are saying with their lips. Somebody who does that, God sees that, God is ashamed. But, he says, if you turn your back on this world, and if you set your face towards heaven, if you turn from your sins, and you live the life he calls you to live, God will be delighted to be called your God. If that is what you're doing, if that's what you're willing to do, then you can know that God has prepared a city for you, that it belongs to you, heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. The new heavens and the new earth that will come through the work of Christ will come for you. And of course, if you know that you have such a heavenly country that is waiting for you after this life, it will give to you the hope that you need to live the life that he calls you to live in this ungodly world in the same way that this encouragement the author to the Hebrews was giving to his readers would give them the courage to continue to profess the Lord Jesus Christ in the face of eminent persecution from the Roman Empire. You will have the courage, you will have the strength, you will have the hope that you need to live in this ungodly world even though you know that you're going to have to suffer for it. So I'll ask you this question this evening. Do you have this hope? I mean, do you have this kind of faith that, 
goes beyond believing to application. Do you believe the promises of God and are they welcome to you? Do you really want to inherit that heavenly kingdom? The Bible says you can only have it if you believe God's promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. If you desire to have this one, the gospel reveals the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And if you actually have a faith that goes beyond the faith of demons, not just believing these things are true, but if you actually apply that to your life, if you actually turn from your sins and trust in Him, if you do that, you can know that this heavenly country is yours and it will give you that hope to endure what you must endure because of the divisions in this world. If you haven't done so, I would encourage you to do so now, that you might trust Jesus and that you might receive this hope and the knowledge that you are safe from God's judgment. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask... Lord, to apply his word as we need to hear it this evening.